Hey everybody, welcome to this, my second of two of three videos on the Canon EOS Digital Rebel XTI. In this video, we're gonna go through the camera's features and functions and talk about how to use it. But being a digital camera, there is nothing whatsoever we can do with this camera without first changing the battery. Now, if you have the battery grip for it, you just flip this open and you can then pop the battery door off and plug in the battery grip, which adds a second battery uh, and a lot more battery life to the camera. To remove the battery, you simply push that orange dude in, pop out the battery that's in there. This is rechargeable, so you can recharge it and grab a different one and pop the battery back into place. If you're starting up your camera and the date is always asking to be reset after you've taken the battery out, that means that your date battery is dead. What you need to do is pull this little CR2016 out of the camera here, pop the CR2016 out of this caddy, put a new one in, and then slide it back into the camera. And that's how you change the date battery. You have to do that about every three to four years. There we go. Next thing let's do is mount and unmount lenses. To remove a lens, you push the lens release button here and turn it counter or anti-clockwise to remove. If you have a lens with a red dot, you line up the two red dots. I don't have any lenses right now that are EFS, but they have a white box instead of the red dot. And if that's the case, you just line up the white boxes. Just line up those indices, turn it clockwise until it clicks into place, and now you have mounted your lens. You're not gonna be able to save any of your images without changing the CF card. So to access the CF card, you lift, you slide this door out and then pull it up. There's only so much I'm going to be able to do here because this has bent pins in it, so I'm not going to be able to actually insert the CF card the whole way. But you would just put the CF card in like that and push down, and then this little button here on the side would pop up. Then when you need to take the, lens, the CF card out, you just push this down, and now you can reach in the CF card and remove it. Come on. Come on. There we go. To change the CF cards. And uh, after this video, this guy is going off to e-waste recycling because with bent CF pins, uh, these are not economical to replace, to repair. So at any rate, that's how you would change the CF card. Next thing let's do, oh, this can take CF cards up to 32 gigabytes, which is a pretty large CF card for 10 megapixel uh, images. Okay, so let's talk about how to use the mode dial, which is this right here, and these are all of the different shooting modes. That index tells you which one of these you have selected. We're gonna start here with ADEP and move down the dial. ADEP stands for Automatic Depth of Field Priority. Basically, what this does is the camera will automatically choose the best aperture and corresponding shutter speed, of course, to get all of your subjects in focus. So let's say that you're standing over here and you have your, uh, your, your kid's baseball team lined up or football team or whatever lined up over here for a shot. The camera will take the, use the best aperture to get the closest of the kids as well as the furthest of the kids in focus. That's ADEP. Manual mode is you are responsible for obtaining a proper meter reading and setting the shutter speed and aperture yourself for proper exposure. So all you have to do is, here we go. Okay. You can see on, you can see on the, you can see on the back here that there is a scale. And that is your metering. But to the, to the right of M, there's a scale that goes from negative two to plus two. And because the CF card pins are bent, I'm not gonna be able to show you exactly how that works. But when you, you have to press the shutter button, a bar will appear underneath it, whether you are underexposed, overexposed, or properly exposed. What you wanna do is use the command dial to set your shutter speed, and then hold the AV button and the command dial to adjust your aperture like that. And 
When the bar gets beneath that little central symbol, that means that you have a properly exposed image and that's when you want to take your picture. If you want to intentionally over or underexpose, you can. If you accidentally over or underexpose, the camera will just do that. In manual mode, the camera assumes you know what you're doing and it will do exactly what you say. And uh, if it's wrong, then it's wrong. AV stands for aperture value, also called aperture priority mode. In this mode, you use the command dial to select your aperture. Once you've selected your aperture, the camera will then select the best shutter speed based on the lighting in your scene. If you cannot use a shutter speed that's available, if you were to say be in full sun and set this to 1 f1.8 when you're at ISO 1600 and you need a shutter speed that's 1 32,000th of a second, this only goes to 1 4,000th. So the shutter speed will or aperture would blink. I can't tell you exactly which one because I can't recall and if I have to press the shutter button I'm going to get an error message. TV for time value or shutter priority is the exact same thing except that you control the, sh the shutter speed and then the camera will pick the best aperture. In program mode the camera will pick the best aperture and shutter speed for you based on the settings. If you hold down the AV button you can intentionally over or underexpose your images. Magical green box is full auto. You have no control over anything at all. Now we get into these scene modes here. If you have a PDF of the manual, page 39 will go into greater detail than I'm going to about what each of these scene modes does. I'm going to go over in general what they do so you have an understanding of what they are and how to use them. This first one is portrait mode. Portrait will give you a depth of field that gets your, your subject's face in focus and gives you a blurry background. You can set up this uh, mode for success by using a lens like the 50 millimeter or your kit lens at the 55 millimeter range uh, or and then you also want to try to have your subject about 9 to 20 feet in front of a background and that will give you a suitably blurry background. Landscape mode is going to disable your flash and use a small aperture for a very deep depth of field so you can get something close to you in front of the lens and at infinity focus in focus. This works best with wide angle lenses or on at, if you're just using the kit zoom lens at 18 millimeters. This is close up or macro mode and what this does is this works best when you are at the nearest focus point of your lens or using a macro lens and it, it will uh, work to give you the best close up focus image you can get. This is sports. Sports will shoot at a fast aperture with the aim of giving you a frozen motion. So if you have somebody jumping, you can freeze them in midair without any blur, for example. This is night portrait mode, and what this is going to do is trigger the flash and give you a long exposure. So this works best if you have a tripod or something to rest your camera on. Let's say that you have a subject who is standing in front of a cityscape. You have them stand there, you use this mode, take your picture, and what it will do is it will uh, trigger the flash to illuminate, illuminate your subject and then it will uh, light up, uh, leave the shutter open to capture the lights of the cityscape. This last one is no flash. This will disable the flash completely so that if you're at a play or in a museum or something like that where you don't want the flash to fire, you can do that. Also, if you're at a sporting event way up in the bleachers and the flash isn't going to do you any good anyway, you can disable it. Next thing let's talk about is the flash hot shoe. So this is the flash hot shoe. There's no PC port. The only way to connect a flash to this camera is with the hot shoe. So what you would need to do is plug your flash in here. If you have a Canon flash, then that's fantastic and this will work with all of the modern can Canon flashes, as well as many of the ones going back into the 90s, for instance. Most also, also many of the third party flashes will also work in this camera. The shutter, one thing not to do 
is don't save a few dollars by getting a 1960s, 70s, or 80s Vivitar Sunpack or similar flash for this camera. Even the Canon flashes of, the, of the, that period had in them exceedingly powerful capacitors. And if those old flashes were to back charge into your camera, it would fry your camera's motherboard. So if you are insistent on using an old flash like that because you need the added power for something or another, just make sure you have a radio frequency trigger between your hot shoe and that flash. No physical connection whatsoever, because if you have that physical connection, there is a risk of that flash destroying your DSLR. The flash sync on this camera is 1 200th of a second. What that means is that when the first curtain opens and it, when it completes its travel over here, the flash will fire. The whole sensor will be open to light for that brief moment and then the second curtain will close after just shy of 1 200th of a second. The shutter speeds on this camera are not controlled by how quickly the shutter curtains move, but by the gap that's between them. So if you have it set to 1 2,000th of a second, the first curtain will open. The second curtain will come in very close behind it. When the first curtain finishes its travel, the flash would fire, and then the second curtain, everything behind the second curtain would be blocked. If you have a Canon flash that can do high speed sync, that's not the case, but this is what we're just talking about here. It's the most basic use of flash. If you have a 10 second exposure, the first curtain opens, the entire sensor is exposed to light for a little bit less than 10 seconds, and then the second curtain comes in and closes. Okay. So, that's the general process of flash use. In the, sec in the third video, we'll, when we go into the menu and the custom functions, we'll, and the custom functions specifically, we'll look at how the flash can be adjusted with this camera to perform slightly differently than that. Next thing let's do is go through some of these buttons on the back and talk about what they are and how to use them. This is the autofocus point selection button, and what you can do is push it to select either oops, all of your autofocus points being selected by the camera automatically or just a specific one. So that gives you a little bit of control over where your camera is going to focus. This is your, auto, your aperture value compensation button. Holding it down allows you to intentionally overexpose or underexpose your images. If you're taking a bracketed sequence, let's say for HDR, or if you wanted to intentionally have a high key or a low key image. This is your drive mode button, single shot, continuous, and self timer. And basically, this will allow you to use a remote control or your self timer. So single shot, you take one picture and you can hold the shutter button down until the universe is heat death and it will not take a second one. Continuous is you hold the shutter button down and it will continue taking photos until the buffer runs out. And the self timer is a countdown or use of the remote control. This button here on top is your ISO selection and you can use it to select the ISO that you would want to use. This is an older camera. The native ISO for the sensor is 200. I would not push it past 400 and uh, 100 is just fine as well. Autofocus, you have one shot, AI focus, and AI servo. One shot is you hold down the autofocus, and when the camera gets focus, it will hold that focus until it takes the picture, as long as you keep holding the shutter button down. AI focus means that the camera will track moving objects as they move around, so that as long as you keep holding the shutter button halfway down, and then that way, if something is moving, it will be in focus when you take the picture. And AI servo, the camera will pick between those two modes depending on what's needed. White balance, you have your white balance settings. Auto means that the camera will evaluate the scene, figure out what the lighting is, and give you the best white balance so that your whites look white. Daylight means that you are, the camera will adjust your white balance so that a white sheet of paper would look white under full sun. 
Same thing under shade in the sun. So this is a sunny day while you're in shade. Same thing, but under a cloud. So basically, if you have a cloudy day, that's what you would use. Tungsten is if you're using tungsten light. This adds a lot of blue to counter the amber color of the tungsten light. Fluorescent light, what this does is add amber to counter the green of the fluorescent light. Flash, this adds a little bit of amber. I'm sorry, tungsten, um, fluorescent adds magenta to counter the green. The uh, flash adds amber to counter the blueness of the light from a flash. And custom allows you to use a custom white balance setting, which you've saved. We'll see how to do, how to do that in video three so that the camera will use that. These are your metering modes, evaluative, partial metering, and center weighted. So evaluative, which is box with circle with dot, looks at the entire scene and breaks it into a bunch of different zones. And then it uses the light in those different zones as well as where your focus is to calculate the best exposure based on that scene. Partial spot uses a, a, a circle at the center of the scene. I think it's about 9% of the center for 100% of, of the metering data. Everything outside of that circle is not used at all for metering. That's really useful if, let's say, you're taking a picture of a person under an awning in the shade with a bright beach in the background. What you would do is you would put the person's face in the center of the frame, uh, save your metering information, either enter it manually or have to press your shutter button, dang it, to, um, hold, to lock that metering information in, then recompose to put the person over here to the side, beach scene in the background. Person will be properly exposed, beach scene will be partly blown out, but it would be better than your beach scene being properly exposed and the person being a silhouette. Center weighted takes uh, what's in the central part of the, of the scene and then we'll use that for the majority of the, of the metering data and then what's around it for part of the metering data, for the balance. I don't remember the exact split. It's probably about 70-30. Display button turns your display on and off. Menu button accesses the menu. Last thing we're going to do in this video is talk about how to take a photo with this camera. It's very easy. It's designed to be very simple. Basically, what you want to do is select the mode you're going to shoot in. If it's manual, you want to dial in your shutter and aperture. Aperture value, dial in your aperture. TV, dial in your shutter. Program or all of the rest of them. Let the camera decide for you what the settings are going to be. Look through the viewfinder. Hold down the shutter button halfway to get your autofocus to engage. Or if you're using manual focus, then manually focus. And then fully depress the, view, the shutter button to take your picture. And I'd show you what that's like, except that because of the bent CF card pins, this is not going to take a picture at all, I don't think. So at any rate, very simple to use, designed to take photos and be very quick at it. And that is everything we had to go over in the second video of, for this, the Canon EOS Digital Rebel XTI. In the third video, we're going to go into the menu system and talk exclusively about the menu items and how to set up this camera to be the ideal shooting machine for you. Thank you for watching this video. Please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comments section below. I'm pretty good about checking these every couple of days and answering questions. If you have any suggestions or ideas for future videos, and if I have the technical know-how and equipment, I'm more than happy to make those. One last thing, thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. I gotta get up, Steinbeck. I have to turn off the camera.